Hello everyone, welcome to the fifth episode of the Reading Buddy Book Club for June, where we are reading Malamander by Thomas Taylor. My name is Miss Emily and I'm an assistant youth and teen librarian here at Fayetteville Public Library and we are so excited to be reading this with you guys. I hope you're enjoying it so far. Where we left off last, Herbie and Violet had gone to Dr. Thalassie's museum and discovered that the ruby egg is indeed a malamander egg. And then when they returned to the hotel, Herbie was called to Lady Kraken's suite where she told him that he would get the egg for her. So things are getting a little crazy. Before we start, make sure you guys have your reading buddy. If you haven't finished your crafts and your coloring pages by now, then go ahead and keep working on those. Or if you would rather, you can go ahead and follow along while I read. First, says Lady Kraken, as I sit down heavily in an armchair, you're going to tell me exactly what Dr. The Lassie and the girl are up to. With a swipe of her hand, the old lady flips a switch on her control box. The French windows swing closed behind her in a last flurry of snow. But your ladiness, you've got it wrong, I say. The doc and Violet aren't working together at all. Violet? asks Lady Kraken. Yes, the girl. She's Violet Parma. She's not after any magical egg. She just wants her mom and dad back. Parma? Lady Kraken taps the arm of her chair. That name! Where have I heard it before? Her father was, sorry, is Peter Parma, I say. Only he's missing, and now I remember, Lady Kraken says, cracking all her knuckles at once. The folklorist, the collector of old tales. He spent many hours here interviewing me about my family. I liked him well enough at the beginning, but in the end, he asked too many questions, pried too deep into my family's misfortune. I have no doubt he wanted the egg too, and no doubt that the malamander devoured him for his trouble. Oh, I say, no doubt at all. None whatsoever, snaps the old lady. But it gives this violet a good motive to get hold of the egg for herself, doesn't it? She could wish him back to life. But, I try to say, so what of Dr. Thalassi? Lady Kraken plows on. He's always been a sly one, that doctor. What part does he play in all of this? I think he's just after evidence, I say, thinking back to our conversation in the museum. I think he just wants to prove one way or another if the creature exists. He's a scientist. Ha! Huh, a likely excuse. I sit up and put my lost and founder's cap firmly back on my head. Lady Kraken, I promise you, you have it all wrong. I mean, yes, you're right, someone is after the egg, but it's not the doc and it's not Vi. I think it's Sebastian Eels. Now it's Lady Kraken's turn to blink with surprise. The rider? He's certainly acting very suspiciously, I say. But then, Mr. Lemon, I am mistaken after all says Lady Kay, scratching her chin as she tumbles this new idea around in her mind. You were right. The girl isn't working with Dr. Thalassi. She's working with Sebastian Eels instead. What? Suddenly it all makes sense. Lady Kraken brings her fist down on the arm of her chair with a bony thud. How could I have been so blind? How could I have missed it? And how could you... Mr. Lemon, have been such an incorrigible dunderbrain as to allow this to happen. Me, I say, shrinking back again. Yes, you. Can't you see how you've been used? Can't you see how this girl has tricked you? You've been duped, Herbert Lemon. Violet Parma is playing you for a fool. But, I almost managed to say. Oh, don't try to argue, says Lady Kay. It all falls into place. The connections become clear. I know Eels and the Parma girl are in this together. I have proof. With a flick of several switches on the old lady's wheelchair, the curtains in the room swish shut, one after another. The lights go out, and there's a whirring sound in the ceiling. I look up to see a hole opening in the ornate plaster high above us. 
Then a shaft of ghostly light flickers in, shining directly down onto the circular table in the center of the room as the camera Luna hums into life. I recorded this three nights ago, says Lady Kraken, as the moon-bright dust motes begin to dance on the tabletop, just after dusk. It can record as well, I say, but Lady Kraken just waves my surprise away. Of course it can record, it's a camera Luna. As I watch, the dust and light form into an eerie, shimmering model of the town again, in three dimensions. But just as I get my bearings, Lady Kraken begins turning dials, and the image swirls and changes. Little figures of townsfolk dart around, walking backward at high speed, as if we were going back in time, and the light comes and goes with the passing of the clouds. Then the image stabilizes at last, as the lady zeroes in on a particular moment and a particular place. That's Sebastian Eels' house, I say. Sure enough, the author's tall, stately townhouse, one of the finest in Erie on Sea, rises up on the table before me in shimmering, dusty detail. As I watch, amazed, I see a tiny figure of Eels himself emerge from the front door of this model house, straighten his neatly folded scarf, and stride off along the tiny street. Now watch closely, says Lady Kraken, dimly lit in the captured moonlight of the past. Just about now, and she points her crooked finger, an even smaller figure appears at the end of the miniature street. It darts into the doorway before re-emerging and creeping ahead, heading always for Eels' house. I stare in amusement. There's no mistaking the cat-like way the figure moves, or the mass of crazy curls on her head, or the woolly bobble cap. It's Violet. This can't be dusk three nights ago, I say, though even as I say it, I cannot help believing that it is. Lady Kraken may have some bonkers ideas, but if there's one thing she's an expert on, it's Cameron Luna's. But since Violet didn't appear at the hotel till long after nightfall, this recording must have been made hours earlier. In other words, hours before I first met her. Keep watching, says Lady Kraken. So I do and I see the little figure of Violet stop outside the house. She goes up to the door and rings the bell. Then she rings it again. No one answers. I watch in shocked fascination as the tiny silvery figure of Violet Parma walks over to a low wall beside the house and lifts herself into a branch of an overhanging tree. She runs up it and drops down the other side of the wall into darkness an empty patch that the camera Luna can't see. A moment or two later, she appears again, climbing into the house of Sebastian Eels by an open window and again vanishing from view. Then, as suddenly as it all began, the light of the camera Luna shuts off and the fairy model of the house collapses into dust. We are plunged into darkness once again. With the flick of a switch, Lady Kay opens the curtains. So, Mr. Lemon, she says, Still sure about that sneaky little friend of yours? In fact, how can you be certain she's even looking for her parents at all? How do you know they aren't here too, hiding, plotting with Sebastian Eels? Yes, I'll wager they're all in it together, conspiring against me, conspiring to get my malamander egg. I stagger to my feet and stumble back toward the door. But, but... Still don't believe me, Mr. Lemon, Lady Kraken continues, her eyes wild. Then just ask yourself one question. What is Violet Parma doing when you aren't with her? But just ask yourself, what is Violet Parma doing right now? I hear the door swing open behind me. I back out through it in a haze of doubt. By the time the door is closed again, I'm running. I run back along the corridor and down the stairs, three at a time. In reception, I don't even slow as I dodge around some guests and their cases and hear ambergris tut-tutting me. I throw open the desk of my cubbyhole to my cellar. Violet, I call, bye, but there's no answer. She isn't there. Chapter 25, 
mysterious visitors. I close my eyes and take a moment to calm myself. It can't be true, I say under my breath. Can it? Then I open my eyes and see that Violet's coat is gone, as well as her mother's boots. Violet is definitely gone out somewhere. I shake my head and try to forget Lady Kay's accusations. After all, so what? Why shouldn't she go out somewhere? She's free to come and go, isn't she? I'm not her keeper, but then again, where would she go? She's still new to this town, or so she says. There's no escaping the fact that I said I'd be out until lunchtime, and here I am, hours earlier than expected, and she's not here. And what about the camera Luna? What about the moonlight recording I saw? Violet went to see Eels before she came to see me. Suddenly, I remember how Violet never did explain why Boathook Man was chasing her. Was that whole episode just an elaborate way to gain my trust? Was that whole episode staged? I grab my Lost and Founders cap with both hands, pull it up as high as I can on the elastic, and let it snap down onto my head. It stings, but it clears my head a little and helps me switch on my logic. There's an innocent explanation, I say aloud. There has to be, and I need to find it. I look at the window. It's slightly open, so Violet probably left that way. At least that means she wasn't caught by old Mollusk. But where is she gone? I screw my hands into my eyes as I try to think it through. She probably hasn't gone to see Jenny Hanover at the Erie Book Dispensary because we already spoke with Jenny yesterday. And probably she wouldn't dare to go back to the museum unless she wants to return the sea glass. But somehow, I don't think she's ready to do that. So where? The beach? On her own? That's possible. But there's another very disturbing possibility. I grab my coat. I slip two hot pebbles into my pockets, put the closed sign up on my cubbyhole, and run out into the snowy town. Sebastian Eels' tall townhouse looked grand enough, built of moats and moonlight on Lady Kraken's table, but it is grander still in real life. It's perched high in the town, its top floor windows giving a commanding view of the bay, surpassed only by that of the Grand Nautilus Hotel below on the seafront. It is painted yellow and has an impossible black door with white columns on either side. Today, in the snow, it is silent. It's eight large front windows, empty and dark. I check the street outside and see several tracks in the snow, including one large set of footprints that emerges from the door of the house. At a guess, I would say that those were made by Eels himself. The footprints show someone leaving, but no one coming back. At the side of the house is a wall, peeling yellow, with a garden beyond. I recognize it from the image in the camera Luna. The branch of a gnarled old tree leans over into the street, and there are smaller footprints leading to it, but not leading away. I look up at the house to see if any windows are open, and that's when I notice him, Erwin. The cat is sitting on top of a nearby wall, watching me with his cool blue eyes. Did she come in this way then? I ask. Her, says Erwin, licking one paw. Fat lot of help you are, I say, grabbing the branch anyway. I swing toward the wall. A moment of scrabbling later and then I'm over the top, tumbling down into a prickly bush on the other side. Ugh, the ladder racks. I cry out as quietly as I can. I get up and pick thorns out of my coat, and I see that the ground floor window is slightly open, just as it must have been three nights ago. You could have warned me about the bush, I whisper to Erwin, but he's no longer there. Through the window, I can see some kind of pantry or larder. It's hard to see much, but on the tiles, just inside the window, I spot a patch of melting snow, and somehow I just know that Violet left it there. I heave myself up onto the sill and slide through the open window. There's a table in front of me, and I have to bite my tongue to stop myself from crying out when I see what's lying there, a human body, except 
Not exactly. At a second glance, I realize it's actually something human body shaped. A wetsuit, I say out loud. And it is, but not the kind you might use for snorkeling on vacation. This is a serious set, complete with air tanks, a helmet, and headlamps. There are other things there too, strange things, lengths of old rubber hose, a saw with long jagged teeth, pneumatic harpoon guns. There is also a pile of cardboard targets, like the ones you get at shooting galleries. I can't help noticing that on each target, the bullseye is riddled with holes. Whoever fired at them is a crack shot. And is this armor? I gasp at the sight of a steel chain mail shirt on a hanger. I touch it and feel its shiny metal links flip between my fingers like scales. A faint noise somewhere in the house jolts me. I mustn't waste time. Sebastian Eels could be home at any moment. I slide the window almost all the way down so that it looks closed at a glance, but can still be opened in a hurry and continue into the house. In the wide entrance hall, there are small drops of melted snow at the bottom of a broad wooden staircase. My heart is pounding as I set off up the stairs, trying not to make them creak. On the second floor is a long landing with a number of doors. One is slightly ajar, and there are rustling sounds from inside. I edge toward it. Violet, I whisper shout. Violet, is that you? But what if it isn't? What if all I'm doing is letting someone else, Eels himself, perhaps, or the boathook man, know that I'm there? This is ridiculous. I shouldn't be here. Yet since I am here, I have to check. I brace myself to run if I need to, but I take another step toward the door. There's a loud click and a clunk from downstairs. It's the sound of the front door being unlocked and opened, followed by the noise of large booted feet stamping off snow. Come in, my old friends, comes a voice I know too well, and I hear two other sets of feet enter the house. It's a long time since I welcomed you here. Sebastian Eels is home. Chapter 26, A Study in Violet. I push my way into the room where I heard the rustling, and I swing the door silently behind me, leaving it open just a sliver. Herbie, Violet looks up from a pile of papers on a desk, astonishment on her face. Herbie, what are you doing here? I give her a look. I could ask her the same question. The book-lined room is clearly a study, with a large desk filling the window. Carved in the middle of it is an old map of the town and harbor, with arrows and markings drawn all over it. Beside the desk is a plan chest, with several of its drawers open, and nearby are boxes of paper notes and charts, many of them scattered over the floor, along with an empty bottle of whiskey. Did you make all this mess? I whisper. No! Do you think I drink whiskey? I silence her with my hand and listen through the door. There is a hum of conversation downstairs, but I can't make out the voices now. It sounds as though Eels and his visitors have gone into another room. How did you know I'd be here? Violet demands. No, Violet, I say. I think the question we should really be asking is, how do you know where Sebastian Eels lives? What? says Violet, looking suddenly flustered. What do you mean? I mean, I say, letting my eyes narrow. I don't remember telling you where he lives, and yet here you are, looking pretty cozy in his study. Violet opens her mouth, then closes it again. No clever answer, I say, my mind full of the things Lady Kay said to me, which suddenly don't seem so crazy. That's not like you. Is there something you're not telling me, Violet? No, of course not. Violet looks confused, or is that more of a guilty expression? So, I say, how did you know Sebastian Eels' address? I, I just found out, that's all. Really? I give her my archiest eyebrow. It doesn't matter, Violet waves the eyebrow away. What matters right now is how we are going to get away now that Eels has come back. And she tiptoes to the door and slips out, completely sidestepping my question. Something, I realize, she's very good at. I follow her through the door and onto the landing. 
The voices are still rumbling somewhere below, just out of earshot. We could run down, Violet whispers, and try to get out the pantry window before they hear us. I shake my head. What if they're in the pantry? Well, what then? asks Violet. Suddenly, the voices get much louder as Eels and his guests come back toward the hall. With the way down blocked, Violet and I get ready to rush further up the stairs, if need be, to the floor above. But first, we strain to listen. Tonight, of course, says the voice of Eels. It's midwinter, after all, the longest night of the year, and an exceptionally low tide. Then a woman says something in reply, but I don't catch it. Who could it be? Violet whispers in my ear. Sounds like a man and a woman. I look at her. You really don't know, I say. Herbie, what is this? What's gotten into you? Of course I don't know. There's no need to worry, comes the booming voice of Eels again, and we hear the front door opening. I merely wish to observe the animal, that's all. The weapon will be for protection only, to scare it away if I'm seen. Goodbye. And the front door closes. Then Sebastian Eels says something that makes me freeze on the spot. You can come out now, he says up the stairs. The coast is clear. I look at Violet, and her eyes go wide. Is he calling her? Then we hear another sound, coming from the room next to the study. There's a muffled thud, then a thump, thump, thump. It sounds like someone walking stiffly across the room toward the door. Come on! Violet pulls my arm, and we race upstairs to the third floor landing. Just in time, a door opens on the landing below. Looking over the banisters, we see a crooked shadow loom across the carpet. Boat hook man. You have been very patient, my old friend, says Eels, heading upstairs to meet him. Come, please, into my study. We need to discuss tonight's plans. Peering down from the door above, we see the writer walk briskly into the book-lined room where Violet and I had been just moments before. The misshapen form of the old mariner sways after him in a cloud of mist, leaving watery footprints on the landing. The door is left open. Tonight, says Boat Hook Man, in his voice like a faraway wind, tonight I will be free. You will, says Eels. I promise. Tonight I will finish it all and end your curse. You'll be Captain Kraken again. Swear to it, gusts the boat hook man. Swear. Don't you wave that hook at me, says Eels, with ice in his voice. Remember how you were when I found you? Nothing more than a foggy patch in that stinking cave, cursed to linger on forever, but growing fainter by the year. I'm giving you the chance to make things right again. All you have to do is keep your side of the bargain and fight the monster while I grab the egg. Boathook Man lets out a long, breathy hiss. But it is, it is invincible. You don't have to win, you fool, Eel shouts. We've been over all this. You just have to keep the creature busy. Once I have the egg, it will all be over. It will kill you, says Boathook Man, like it killed my crew, my fine, brave men. It has a weakness, says Eels. It can be destroyed. But this weakness... We do not know it. If Peter Parma can find it, then so can I. Eel snaps. It can't be too complicated. He even put it in his stupid book. We have his book, guests Boathook Man. Yet still, we do not know. Even from up here, I can hear Eels grinding his teeth. Only because precious Peter removed that page. Curse him. Then we should delay, Boathook Man sighs. Wait till next year. Find the missing page. No, Eel shouts. I've waited long enough. I deserve the egg. I'll be damned if I'm going to let this bleeding heart Peter stand in my way, even from beyond the grave. We carry on as planned. Once I have the egg, I can use it to find the creature's weakness. I thought this too, Boathook Man's voice breaks a little, all those years ago. 
but I failed and was cursed forever. Enough of your whining, Eels brings his fist down on the desk. It's not my fault you didn't have the wit or the will to use the egg properly, but with its power, I will be able to know anything, to do anything. I'll use that power to destroy the Malamander. I'll put a dozen harpoons through its stinking fish guts before it can even spit. Then the egg will be mine forever. And the others? Guesses the voice of Boathook Man. If they come to stop you... Oh, don't worry about them. Eels gives a snort of contempt. I'm not going to let a couple of do-gooders get in my way. I have plenty of harpoons, and the sea will quickly dispose of their bodies. Chapter 27. Fear and Vapor Suddenly, the idea of creeping back downstairs past the study door doesn't seem very appealing. I look at Violet, who is pointing upward. The third flight of stairs in Sebastian Eels' house is narrower than the others. We creep up and find an attic floor with lower ceilings. There must be another way out, Violet whispers, and she pushes open the nearest door. It creaks loudly, and we freeze where we stand. But no angry voice shouts up at us, and the two men remain in the study below, engrossed in their talk of nighttime plans and harpoon guns. We enter what looks like a small storage room, filled with old furniture and crates. There's a small sink in the corner with the dripping tap. Outside the single dormer window, I see the snow-laden tiles of the roof. Are you good with heights? Violet asks. Of course, I squeak, if they're good with me. Violet heads to the window. Wait, I say, I need to know something first. Herbie, what is wrong with you? I, I just need to know that you aren't keeping anything from me. Like what? Like, I tug at my cap. Like who those people are who visited Eels just now, the man and the woman. How would I know that? Violet almost forgets to whisper. Then she stares at me. You don't think... I don't know what to think anymore, I say with a shrug. But I only have your word for it and that you are looking for your parents. It seems to me it's going to be impossible to find them, and yet here you are anyway, poking around in Eels' study and getting involved in our local legends. Violet's expression is cold and incredulous. For a moment, the only sound is the dripping of the tap. Poking around, Violet says at last. She's squared up to me now and balled her fist. It's your stupid legends that got involved with me. I know I'm being unreasonable, but something still doesn't add up. Just then, the dripping tap starts to rattle, water spurting from the spout. We both turn to it. As we watch, vapor begins to pour out of the tap, billowing into a cloud of mist. But it doesn't move like an ordinary cloud. It gathers instead into a shape, a great looming shape, the shape of a man. Boat hook man? Violet and I both cry out. And it's true, no matter how unbelievable it sounds. The mist is rapidly solidifying into the old captain, his vacant eyes, his dripping beard, and the part that is most solid of all is his vicious hook. The window, Violet yells, and she twists the catch, flinging it open. Boathook man lifts his hook hand high and sweeps it toward me. I drop to the floorboards, and his arm slices through the air where I was just standing, showering me with water. You cannot stop us, he roars like a gathering storm. I will be free. By now, Violet is out the window and clinging to the snowy frame. Quick, Herbie. I jump to my feet, pushing my cap out of my eyes, but Boat Hook Man is between me and the window now, bringing his hook hand up again. I grab something from the nearest crate, an old silver tea tray, and stop it like a shield just as the hook comes crashing down. I see the underside of the tray bulge and split as the hook punctures it. The tray is wrenched from my hand. The man bellows with fury. I lunge straight for the window, but I don't think I'll make it. Then something white flashes past me and flies up at Boat Hook Man. It spits and hisses and wraps itself around the man's face. I look back and realize what it is. Erwin! 
The cat is attacking the old mariner's head ferociously, raking at him with his claws. But instead of blood, only water spouts from the wounds. Come on, shouts Violet, and I don't need to be told again. I grab her hand as she pulls me out onto the roof, or rather, the narrow stretch of roof below the window sill. The snowy ground, four stories below, wavers before my eyes. Boathook Man finally gets his hand on Irwin, and the poor cat is flung to one side. I wish I could do something to help Irwin, but it's all I can do to edge away from the window before Boathook Man lunges at it, his face a black roar, his beard streaming with salt water from his torn face. He thrusts his hook hand forward again, but the tray is still stuck to it, and it catches on the window. Don't look down, says Violet, pulling me further away, her feet braced against the lead guttering. It bulges with our combined weight. The roof is steep, and the tiles offer no grip whatsoever. Where should I look, then? I gasp as the guttering makes another groan. Back? I give back a try and instantly regret it. Boat hook man is already climbing out the window, the tray shaken free from his hook. The next door roof looks flatter, says Violet, and it's only a small jump. Jump, I say, but what choice do we have? Boat hook man is standing on the gutter now, which shrieks and twists as the metal gives under his watery bulk. And I'm not far enough away. He raises his hook hand to strike at me yet again, so I duck. Then something happens that changes everything. An object flashes over my hand. It's one of Sebastian Eels' steel harpoons. If I hadn't been ducking at this moment, the harpoon wouldn't have flashed over anything because it would have been going straight through me. Instead, it cracks the roof tiles above with a crack sending up an explosion of snow before ricocheting back and clonking Boathook Man in the face. The ancient sailor, as surprised as I am by this, clutches at his face with both hand and hook and lets go of the window frame, and he falls. I can't turn away, can't not look as the man plunges down, 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 and shatters into a great cloud of swirling vapor and ice particles onto the cobbles below. As the mist whirls away into nothing, I see someone standing there, just beyond the empty man-shaped crater of the snow, Sebastian Eels, looking up at us, fury on his face, and still holding his harpoon gun. Now, shouts Vi, and she runs at the gap to the next house. Without pausing, she jumps. She lands, and her feet slide, leaning forward into the tiles. She braces against the gutter and stops. Herbie, come on! I look down again. Sebastian Eels raises his harpoon gun and takes aim. I don't even have time to straighten my cap. I run at the gap and jump. It's as I'm sailing through the frosty air, high above the town of Erion Sea, that I see the harpoon hit Violet. Okay, chapter 28, Silver Tipped. I don't shout, I don't even say the bad word, I'm too shocked. Somehow, on autopilot, I land on the roof and brace myself. The only thing I can see, the only thing I can focus on, is Violet falling back against the roof tiles, the harpoon sticking out of her chest. No, 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 I start yammering. Violet, no. I grab the harpoon and pull it out. There's no blood, but I put my hand on her chest and push hard before any can start gushing. What are you doing? Violet looks at me, dazed. I let go, expecting my hand to come away crimson and dripping, but there is still no blood. Violet, stay calm. I can get you to Dr. Thalassi. He can do something. They can do amazing things these days, doctors. And Violet reaches into her coat. She pulls out the blue-green volume she was dispensed by her mermonkey. Its cover is pierced with a neat triangular hole, right through the second A in Malamander. She turns it over, and we see a small bulge where the harpoon nearly, but not quite, punctured through the other side. If this book had been a page shorter, 
says Vi, staring. I wouldn't have lived to finish it. I'm still holding the harpoon. I see it trembling in my hand. I look down to where Eels was standing, but the man is no longer outside his house. He's probably coming up the stairs for a closer shot, says Vi, pulling herself up. Come on. Come on where, I say. But before Violet can reply, there's a meow from the apex of the roof. Erwin! And sure enough, the cat is sitting there, looking only slightly tousled after his encounter with Bowhook Man. We manage to climb up to join him, and then all three of us slide down the other side. Without warning, Erwin hops over the edge. Looking over, we are relieved to see the cat standing on a metal balcony just below, and connected to this is an old fire escape. We reach the bottom of the rusty metal steps, and I'm surprised to see no one has called out or challenged us during our descent. Even when we scramble over a garden wall and drop into a neighboring street, in front of a startled old man walking a snarly dog, no one shouts. Violet scoops up Irwin, and we hurry away, trying to act as normal as possible, even though my heart is rattling around in my ribcage like a rubber ball and my legs feel like squids. Will we be safe? Violet gasps. In the hotel? Don't know, I say. But where else can we go? We stop for a moment to get our breath back. I think the place I most want to go right now, says Violet after a moment, is Jenny Hanover's shop. I nod. We should take Erwin back anyway. Thank you, puss, says Vi, giving him a quick kiss on the head as we hurry away. I hope you didn't get hurt. Erwin closes his eyes and purrs. When we reach the Erie Book Dispensary, I'm surprised to find it's closed and all dark inside. I rattle the door handle uselessly before slumping down on the doorstep. Stupidly, I'm still clutching the harpoon. Violet sits down beside me. Did you see, she says, Boothook Man, did you, did he really? I nod, like a ghost. Violet continues. He came out of the tap like a ghost. I didn't think such things were possible. I shrug. If the impossible is possible anywhere, it'll be possible in Erie on Sea. Hey, that's quite good, that is. I should say it more often. Then I realized that it wasn't actually me who said it at all, and it wasn't Violet. We both look at Erwin. The cat narrows his blue eyes at us and emits a smug purr. You heard him that time, right? Violet says to me. Herbie, please tell me you just heard Irwin say those words. I heard him, I say. Then I turn back to the cat. Hey, Fleabag, you talking to everyone now, are you? Cats don't have eyebrows, but Irwin manages to raise one at me anyway. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I say. Fleabag isn't fair. Not after you saved me from Boathook Man. But I thought you spoke only to me. I thought we agreed years ago that you'd keep it a secret. Erwin half lowered his eyelids at me and, in a bored human voice, says, Meow, but the look on his face is all, Oh, Herbie Lemon, I didn't agree to any such thing. Then the cat climbs onto Violet's lap and purrs in exaggerated contentment as she strokes him. This town is weird, says Violet in an amazed voice. Weird, but wonderful. Weird and wonderful, yes, I say, but also dangerous. Thanks again, Erwin. I give the cat a scratch behind his ear. And how about me, Herbie, says Violet, sticking her chin out. Still not sure you can trust me? I mean, now that I've been shot and nearly killed by a harpoon, do you still think I'm in cahoots with Sebastian Eels? I adjust my cap and nearly meet her eye. Um, I say, twiddling that very same harpoon between my fingers. Sorry about that. How could you even think it? It's just, I say, Vi, how did you know where Eels lives? Violet's chin wobbles slightly. Okay, she says. I suppose I haven't been completely straight with you. Oh? She folds her arms. Look, it took me a long time to pluck up the courage to leave my guardian and come here, Herbie, and I might not have come at all if Great Aunt Winnegar hadn't decided to start a new life in Tasmania. You came here from Tasmania? No, says Violet. Tasmania is on the other side of the world. 
If I'd gone too, it would have been years before I could come to Erie on Sea, if ever. But I knew that if I ran away just as we were due to leave, my guardian wouldn't bother trying to find me. She'd never risk missing her boat, and that new life she wanted would certainly be happier without me getting in the way. Erwin arches his back and rubs Violet's cheek with his head. Anyway, says Vi, it also meant that I had less time to prepare than I thought, less time to research Erie on Sea. Almost all the information I could find was about Sebastian Eels. Eels? Yes. He's more famous than you realize, Herbie. My local library has lots of his books. Even Great Aunt Winnegar has read some. So when I got here, I honestly thought he would be my main lead to my parents. I imagined, since my dad is an author too, that Eels would have known him, that they would have been friends. It's what gave me the idea to come here in the first place. But I thought you said you came to see me, I say, though I hate the whiny tone it brings to my voice. You said you needed a detective, that you needed my lost and foundry to solve the case. You said I was famous. Oh, Herbie, I do need you. I didn't lie. It's just that I'd never met you, and the hotel sounded so strange when I read about it, and I was nervous about coming to such a grand old place. I didn't know how you would react. So instead, when I arrived at the railway station, I asked them on the way to Sebastian Eels' house, and they told me, simple as that. I went there just to look at first, but when I saw the back window was open, I thought, well, I thought, you thought you'd start your adventure without me. Don't say it like that, says Violet with a groan. Anyway, I had a good look over the house, which I thought was empty, and found the study. When I was just about to get down to some serious rummaging, when I realized there was someone there. Eels, I say? But Violet shakes her head and shudders. No, worse. Imagine how it felt to be in a stranger's house, without permission, in the dark, and see Boathook Man emerging from the shadows. It was terrifying. That's when you came to the hotel? Violet nods. I tried to lose him. I ran and ran, but he was faster than I would ever have imagined. I couldn't shake him off. I didn't know where else to go. And that's it, I say. That's all you were keeping from me? Yes, I promise, Violet says. I should have told you sooner. I just thought you'd get the wrong idea if you knew where I'd been and what I'd been doing. And I was right, wasn't I? I say nothing. I lift my eyes to the glass tower of the Grand Nautilus Hotel, peering like an eye over the roofs and eaves of the old town. Lady Kraken can see a lot with that camera luna of hers, but seeing isn't necessarily understanding. No wonder she needs someone like me on the ground. For a moment, I'm tempted to wave up at her. Then it crosses my mind to make a rude sign. In the end, though, I just get to my feet and brush the snow off my bottom. I'm starving, I say. Let's go to Seagulls for chips. We need to figure out what to do next. Good idea, says Vi, standing too. Erwin strolls over to the door of the book dispensary and meows, pawing at the door. I'm sorry, Puss, but it's locked, says Vi, and she rattles the handle to show him. You'll just have to wait for Jenny to... Then she stops. We both stare open-mouthed at the door, which I swear was locked fast a moment ago, swings quietly open. Here we go. Chapter 29, The Achilles Spot. It's dark inside the book dispensary. The fire is cold in the hearth, and the only light comes from the tall bay window. Hello? I call. There's no answer. We really shouldn't be in here, says Vi, hesitating in the doorway. Ha, huh, I reply, says the girl who breaks into people's houses all the time. Besides, it kind of feels as if Irwin has invited us in. This is his home, too. I don't think Jenny would mind. As if to confirm this, Irwin jumps onto one of the armchairs and curls up. But I cannot help noticing that he keeps one of his eyes open, watching us. Violet walks over to the mer-monkey, and I join her. The creature leers down at us over its black typewriter, its hairy shoulders hunched, its giant battered top hat extended for the offering. There's a slight waft of burned hair and spent fuses around it. Thinking of asking it what we should do next, I say. People do that, you know. 
ask it for guidance, but you have to be careful. What do you mean? says Violet. Well, you never know if the book it dispenses will tell you something about your future, or something about your past, or something else entirely. I mean, a man once who swears he belched in front of the mermonkey got dispensed a copy of Gone with the Wind, so it definitely has a sense of humor, too. Violet shrugs. It doesn't feel like the moment for a new book, she says. I'm just working through the last one. You're probably right, I say. Anyway, did you find anything interesting in Eels' study? Yes, my dad's manuscript, his unpublished book about the Malamander. It was all just lying there on the desk. Eels must have stolen it from my parents' luggage, as we thought, but there's a page missing. Eels has stuck notes all over the pages next to it, trying to figure out what was in that missing part, but it doesn't look as if he could do it. That missing page must be pretty important, I say, remembering the conversation we overheard from the study. Eel says it was the page where my dad described the Malamander's one weakness, says Violet. The gap in his armor that he will need to know about if he's going to be sure of killing it and keeping the egg. Then your dad did the right thing by taking it out, I say. I can't believe he put in something like that. He probably couldn't help himself, says Violet. From all I've heard, I think my dad loved the old stories too much. I expect he couldn't bear to leave anything out. In the end, though, he must have known it was a mistake and hid the page somewhere. Maybe he sensed danger from Eels. Thank goodness he did. It sounds as though Eels is crazy enough to try to steal the egg anyway, I say, so hopefully the big bully will get himself eaten by the monster and the rest of us can live happily ever after. I won't, though, will I? She says with a sigh. I still won't know what happened to my mom and dad. I nod. What can I say to that? Then I think of something. Let's go get those chips. I turn and head toward the shop door. Then I see that Violet hasn't moved. Herbie, do you remember what Jenny said about my dad's last visit to the book dispensary? She asked, the time he brought my mom. Yeah, I say. She said he wanted to show the mermonkey to your mother and that he had his manuscript with him. But there was something else, says Violet. Don't you remember? Jenny said Dad was goofing around with the mermonkey's hat, trying it on. I shrug. Why is that important? But then, hey, wait, what are you doing? I blurt out, because Violet has tucked the mermonkey's top hat right out of his hand. The mermonkey shivers, and a few dead flies fall to the floor, but the creature remains inactive. Violet raises the crumbling hat with both hands, as if about to put it on even though there's no way it would go over her mass of curls. Then she lowers it again and peers inside. Vi, you should put that hat back, I say. Jenny won't mind us being in the shop, but she will mind very much if we break the mermonkey. You heard what she said about your dad always having to fix it. But Violet just peers even closer into the fuzzy old hat. I did hear, she said. I heard that he even patches up the very hat, though the band inside is loose and the lining is coming out. The whole cronky apparatus must be a hundred years old at least. I start hopping from one foot to the other as I watch Violet poking her finger into the lining of the hat. Vi, please be careful. There seems to be something here, she says, something behind the band. Then she pulls out a small square of folded paper. Violet looks at me. Her eyes go wide. I clutch my cap. No way, I say. Is that... Then we both speak. The missing page! Violet shoves the hat back into the mermonkey's hand and unfolds the paper. Sure enough, it's a page from a typed manuscript. At the top of the title, as if it's the start of a new chapter. The Achilles spot, says Violet, reading the title aloud. Then she starts to read the rest. Now we come to the matter of the Malamander's fabled weakness, the one vulnerability that renders the otherwise invincible monster all too invincible. We have already seen in previous chapters that many of the oldest accounts of the Malamander legend allude to this so-called Achilles spot, without ever describing it. However, I intend to break with tradition and set out plainly that the Malamander's one vulnerability is... Violet stops reading. A shadow has been thrown across the page. We both look up. Well, don't stop there. 
says Sebastian Eels from the doorway of the book dispensary. You are just getting to the good bit. And that's where we're going to stop for today. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying the Malamander as much as I am. Um, I will have another video out for you guys in a few days. And I'll see you next time. Bye!